Good evening, and welcome again to Public Perspective. I'm your host, Kevin McDermott. And if you've lived in the Chicago area for long, you know that this is a city that still wrestles with issues of segregation, racial discrimination in housing, jobs, and a number of other areas. So tonight, our guest is a professor from University of Illinois at Chicago, Maria Kreisen. That's good to have you here. And you're also the co-author of a book about segregation called mm -hmm. Good Enough, The Cycle of Segregation, right? Yes. So thank you. Welcome uh, to the show. Thank it's you for having me. It's great yeah. to be here. Uh, so let's talk a little bit um, about segregation as an issue. Let's start there. I mean, this is a very difficult topic, and there's a lot to be discussed. But mm -hmm. um, talk about segregation in, in housing and how prevalent it is in a city like Chicago. So yeah, Chicago has the dubious distinction of being among the top you know, demographers calculate these numbers about what, what segregation levels, they put a number on it. And there's three or four cities in the country that sort of vie for being in the top three. They switch places every once in a while, but we're about in the top three to five, depending on which year, of the most segregated residentially um, cities in the country. And um, how long has that been going on? How long have we been in those top, in the top five? Decades decades. I mean, all of these sort of northern Rust Belt cities, Detroit, mm -hmm. Milwaukee, New York, um, have all just been, you know, since we've been tracking this challenge of se segregation, have been in the... And are areas. the top cities generally in the north? Mm -hmm. Which is interesting because the, I think the general conception of most Americans is probably that the south is more segregated than the north, but that's mm -hmm. not in fact the case. No, mm -mm. no. The north has been has been recently, I mean, the big cities, the Rust Belt mm -hmm. cities are the ones that are continue to be deeply segregated, be and deeply divided. More or less always these same five? Or um, yeah, I'm sure I'm forgetting some and I'll remember them later yeah. tonight. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, Cleveland is in there. Yeah. Um, yep. Uh, so historically, how did we get here? I mean, how did these cities arrive at this place of being the most segregated and in this kind of locked-in position. Well, we'll get to why they're locked in. That's the subject of the book. Right. Um, but how do you think we got there in the first place? Well, I think if I, if I were to go back, I mean, I think it's complicated. All of these things are complicated, sure. the forces that created segregation. But I think if we think about the time when these cities grew up, it was a time when there was a, the, the systems at the federal, the state, and the local levels were all deeply racialized and explicitly so. So many of the policies that we've that we created while these cities, while cities like Chicago were expanding, right, in the suburbs and developing into these major metropolitan areas, it was, um, you know, federal policies dictating um, highway construction, dictating where public housing was cited, and all of those had rules about what you could and couldn't do based on your race. You know, um, someone I know uh, years ago we were talking about. Um, public housing, uh, which became largely minority housing. Um, and, and we're talking with this person about uh, how that had come to be. And uh, he cynically said, well, it was storage. It was a place to put all these people. And uh, actually, white people, when, when public housing was born, it was intended for white people. <laughs> uh, and it, so, yes, it was to address, and now you're starting to get into my, my history isn't mm -hmm. so great, but um, you know, it was, uh, public housing was built to, to address the needs of white people who, it was a housing crisis. So they created public housing. Mm -hmm. It was not, did not start as a, as a solution to African American housing problems. In fact, they were excluded from many and public housing was um, created and it was created in a segregated fashion. So uh -huh. there were not integrated public housing sites either. And it was only as things like um, you know, the expansion and the mortgages and the ability uh, for people to access purchasing homes that white people were allowed to do those things and mm -hmm. get the mortgages and the highways were constructed so that white people could go live in the suburbs and still work in the cities. Um, at that point, then public housing began to be opened up. More public housing, what was formerly all white public mm -hmm. housing, became opened up to African Americans. So and eventually became primarily, primarily African American. African -American in places like Chicago, yeah. So I would highly commend Richard Rothstein's book, The Color of Law, for anybody mm. interested in reading about that, the ways in which the, the federal, state, and local policies baked us into this system of segregation that we're living in today. Well, and that baked in uh, problem is part of the book that I will actually hold up, The Cycle of Segregation. Uh, 
Um, so this is really talking about that, and you've come up with, as we talked about before, a tongue-twisting name for yes. this, uh, <laughs> social structural uh, sorting, right? Mm -hmm. S3. Yes. <laughs> uh, so uh, talk about that a little bit. What, what's happening there? What does that concept mean? Right. So, so the idea, just to back up a little bit, the idea is that we have this system of segregation that's been baked in. And for decades, sociologists and demographers and economists have argued about what is causing the continuation mm -hmm. of segregation, particularly when we think of sort of the big three explanations that people have for why segregation exists. One of them is an economic argument that says that because there's racial differences in, in income and wealth and things like that, we have segregation because neighborhoods are also segregated by income. And so those mm -hmm. racial differences translate. Um, there's an argument about preferences that says that it has to do with people not wanting to live with people of different races and ethnicities. And then there's a discrimination argument, the argument that um, certain people are discriminated against as they try to access neighbor homes in neighborhoods of certain racial composition. And I would assume there's some element of truth in each of those three. Absolutely, an element right? of truth in all of those. Mm -hmm. um, the, the problem, the sort of conundrum that my co-author and I faced was that there are those three things. In all three of those ways, in all three of those things, there has been progress. So there's been an expansion of the black middle class over the last decades, right? There's been a softening of white racial attitudes to some mm -hmm. extent in certain kinds. And discrimination, which was um, made illegal 50 years ago yesterday on April 11th, 1968, <laughs> um, you know, has reduced mm -hmm. explicit and blatant uh, discrimination in the mm -hmm. housing market. So the question is why, in the face of those three trends, do we still have segregation at only incrementally smaller levels in places like Chicago, mm -hmm. right? It, especially in places uh, that are, you know, the, the, there, has been, there are communities in the, in the country that have reduced their levels of segregation. Chicago has reduced them some, but not very much. So the question is, why is it so glacially slow? So, so that's the subject of the book. Why, why have we found ourselves in this seemingly immovable position? Correct, correct. And we're, our, our argument, the social structural sorting mm -hmm. perspective, is basically saying, you know, these big three, we call them, that I really just mm -hmm. reviewed, mm -hmm. are, um, are important but they're not the only drivers of segregation. And our social structural sorting perspective mm -hmm. is trying to draw attention to some of the sort of mundane, I call them hidden in plain sight causes of segregation today. And it's kind of said, in the context of a segregated city, here's what keeps this ball rolling. Here's what keeps the segregation perpetual. Because people move all the time, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot of mobility. People move to new apartments, to new homes all, all the time. So why in that process is, given that there's all these opportunities that segregation could be declining, why is it that it just keeps perpetuating itself? And if I uh, can summarize, uh, mm -hmm. not to Please for do. me to explain <laughs> your book to you. Please, but, it's sometimes um, best that way. <laughs> uh, but as I understand it, it, it's because of really kind of an internal sorting uh, process that people go through. I predetermine what neighborhoods I think are appropriate for me. Um, uh, being white, I might not want to live in black neighborhoods or Hispanic neighborhoods. Um, I might not want to live in a, in a neighborhood that I think is too expensive. Well, I'm not going to look there because I can't afford it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I might not want to look in a neighborhood that's really too cheap because, well, that'll be riddled with crime and, and drugs and God knows what else. Mm -hmm. So I'll pre-select mm -hmm. uh, what may end up being a very limited range of potential places to live that are probably going to look a lot like where I live now. Right, right. So that's the gist of it, yes. But the important piece of this is that it, our book focuses on where do you get that information, right? Where, does, where do mm -hmm. those perceptions come from? Not just the linkages you made, but just think about the metropolitan area and think about the places you know and th that you don't know. It's hard to think about the places you don't know, but <laughs> think about right. the characteristics of different neighborhoods. And our, the argument in our book is that those perceptions are informed by social processes. So they're informed by our social networks, the people that we know. They're informed by our lived experiences, right? Where we go to school, where we go to shop, where we go to um, do fun things that we enjoy mm -hmm. doing. And that those, those pieces, the crucial part of this is that all of those things, social networks, lived experiences, and the media, of course, informs us mm -hmm. about many of our perceptions. All of those things, in many ways, are very racialized. And so they are serving to funnel people into making moves that are 
continuing segregation. And as I understand it, though, it's not, it's not that it's um, deliberate no. or, or even mm -hmm. uh, malevolent in any way. No, no. It, it's just sort of, as you mentioned earlier, baked in. So, for example, uh, I'm going to talk to friends who probably think similarly to mm -hmm. me or have similar experiences. They, go, they live in similar neighborhoods or know of similar neighborhoods. And, and so, as, if I understand, that's, yes. that's kind of the environment in which this uh, S3 right. <laughs> uh, starts to happen. Is right. So because, yes, exactly. So if you think about the last time you made a move, right, think of the, who you asked and who, you, you got your information from people mm -hmm. that probably are like you. This, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, people live very racially separate lives, even if they're not doing it on purpose, right? They, they're, the people they know, we know from mm -hmm. other social science research that our social networks tend to be racially homogeneous. Mm -hmm. They tend to, people look like us. So if those are the people that are informing me, it's not like they come up to you and say, hey, you know, I know you want a white neighborhood. Let me tell you about my <laughs> white neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? It's, oh, you know what? I know somebody who lives in such and such a place. You should really look there. I heard it's really nice there. Right? And that information, it, like you said, it's not intentionally mm -hmm. racialized, but it is. And, and why are our social networks racialized? Why are our lived experiences racially segregated? Because of housing segregation, right? So the, mm -hmm. the segregated, our segregated networks are in part reinforced and supported and created by our segregated communities. And in fact, as I read, uh, that this is a, a fundamental problem with the continuing segregation of schools. Because public schools, well, you know, they serve the neighborhood that they're in mm -hmm. to a large extent, busing notwithstanding. Uh, so you've got a concentration of people of color. Well, then the school is going to be largely people of color mm -hmm. or white mm -hmm. or, uh, or even if it extends to Asian or, or Indian or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so this is such a baked-in problem. You mentioned that there are areas in the country, though, that seem to have been able to make progress in this area. So how have they try to break this kind of cycle? So when I said that <laughs> about there being places that have mm -hmm. declined in segregation, when um, one of the interesting figures in our book shows, the, it, with bubble sizes, it shows mm -hmm. bubble chart, and it shows the places that have reduced the most are the places with the fewest, the smallest percentage of African Americans. So it tends to be communities, I mean, there aren't very many African Americans. I mean, so the preponderance of the African American population in the United States lives in the cities that have the highest segregation, accomplished right. the least in terms mm -hmm. of reducing their levels of segregation. So um, there's, you know, I think there's there's different sort of factors that predict a little bit. We know a little bit about what um, makes places more integrated or what stabilizes mm -hmm. integration. Sometimes, for example, institutions, if there's a large educational institution or a military base nearby, those can be large institutions that stabilize communities that if they're racially integrated, mm -hmm. they remain that way. But you know, for decades, an a integrated neighborhood was just one that was on its way from becoming, <laughs> from going all white to all black, right? It was that yeah. moment in time you yeah. could freeze it where it's integrated today, but we don't know if it's going to be integrated. But there later. are there are but there are places yes and there right? are mm -hmm. and one of the ones you mentioned in your book is the Oak Park which is a suburb right. here right here right in Chicago. exactly um, and you describe uh, the kinds of efforts that, that the village of Oak Park went through which is very intensive and and a lot of counseling of people coming mm -hmm. in um, working with realtors to, to prevent the kind of guidance of people into certain neighborhoods right um, and although that appears to have been successful and has been in place now for several decades. Right. Um, how replicable is that model? So I think there are pieces of that model that are replicable and they, they, the pieces that are important come to light when you think about um, how people search for housing. And we've started to touch on that, mm -hmm. right? You draw on your social networks, you draw on your lived experiences. So if you think about those processes that people go through and you ask yourself, how can I interrupt this mm -hmm. self-perpetuating process? It's not that I'm going to tell you where to live, but how can you mm -hmm. interrupt and expand people's social, the, the information that they're getting? So it's not about expanding their social networks. Mm -hmm. That's a little indirect. Right, <laughs> It'll right. take a while. And, yes. But it's about saying, okay, we know people get stuff from their social networks. We know that people, for example, tend to know more about the communities and neighborhoods that are dominated by their own racial group. So how can we change that? How can we provide more information to people to break down these racial blind spots?
right? So you can think about campaigns, PR campaigns, and it's, hmm. you know, you can say, ask yourself, and you see this around the city occasionally. I remember um, several years ago, Berwyn had these big billboards that were advertising itself as a community, mm -hmm. right? So it's just saying, put me, put, put, put my community on your radar screen, right? And that's one of the things that, that people can do that can say, you know, how can we get ourselves out there? If we know mostly people learn about these through social networks, how can we actively promote ourselves as a community? What advertising, that's what Oak Park did early on. They advertised in the Chicago Magazine mm -hmm. and New York Time, New Yorker Magazine, things like this to say, we're out here, we're here, and they're interrupting the normal source of information. With the, with the counseling, right, that's sort of saying people come with predispositions about where they should live and mm -hmm. where they shouldn't live, and how can we interrupt, and they base this on their, what somebody told them, or they base it mm -hmm. on their experience driving down the street. Well, intervene in that and say, don't tell these people where to live, but just say, you know, have you considered? Mm -hmm. you don't, you're making assumptions about what this place would be like and what this place would be like. Let me show you how that assumption is false. So that would require um, a municipality uh, to care about it. Hey, to be about intentional it. about it. And it yep. has to be very intentional. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yes. and there's a lot of follow-up that has to be done. Um, and particularly in a, a society like today's where we see what appears to be ever greater racial polarization. Mm -hmm. um, what's the motivation? How, why would a town like Berwyn or any place, Burr Ridge, any, any, many of the suburbs around Chicago, or even Chicago neighborhoods within the city, why would they want to do this in today's environment? What motivation can be given to them to say, this is really good for you? I think, well, I mean, I think it's a moral question, <laughs> right? There's a, there's a, for exactly what you were saying. I mean, the inequality is, is baking and it's causing problems mm -hmm. for all of us. It's not, you know, even if you think you've created a situation where it doesn't touch you, it does touch you. Mm -hmm. um, that's one thing. Now, it's interesting, when we finished the book, it was uh, um, published technically in 2017, but we finished the book earlier than that. And there had been some great efforts on the part of, the, of HUD, mm -hmm. Housing and Urban Development, to um, reinvigorate or invigorate the one of the important clauses of the Fair Housing Act, which was that on the one hand, the Fair Housing Act, which of 1968, which made it illegal to discriminate on the basis of race um, in terms of the rental and selling and mortgage mm -hmm. lending of um, housing, has been the focus of much of our attention for the last 50 years on that Housing Act has mm -hmm. been to eliminate discrimination. What was um, encouraging about the Obama administration's HUD actions is that they were focusing on a second clause that was just as important at the time and should have been but has not been paid attention to, which was to affirmatively further fair housing, which meant that you needed to identify what the barriers were to integration in your community and do something to overcome those barriers. Now, how did the act mandate that? What what? using those words that you you're required to affirmatively further fair housing but who is required to do so that? community so in the case of i mean the 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 carrot stick mm -hmm. <laughs> the stick mm -hmm. is funding from hud okay. so if a community is to accept funding from hud then these they are the need rules. to yes these are the rules mm -hmm. and the rules have always been there they just mm -hmm. hadn't been Enforced. had any meat to you know had any muscle to them if you will and so the the Ob right you know at the very end of the obama administration they impl they created new rules. It takes years to create rules for these kinds sure. of things. Sure. So they created the rules and they were rolling them out. Um, and in that, in that emphasis by HUD, they were acknowledging in some ways the mm -hmm. kinds of things that we talk about in the book in the sense, not by name, of course, they didn't know right. about our book, right. but, but the idea that there are more than just, it's more than just discrimination that creates a segregated city. And so we need to figure out what those barriers are. And our book is, the, the, the goal of, uh, part of the goal of our book is to identify those barriers by name and say, here's some things that you can do, and here's why it's not just discrimination. So, uh, but to, to do this, and I'm thinking about uh, the, the enforcement mechanism being HUD and HUD funding, um, a lot of communities that we might want to see more integrated may not care about HUD funding. Mm -hmm. So, so there's a limited, um, a limited area where these can be effective. You know, I'm not sure Lake Forest cares about HUD funding. Or 
Oak Brook for that matter, Naperville, any of these uh, upscale communities. Um, what's to motivate them? I don't know that I have a good answer to that. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not trying to stump you. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, but it, it's a, it, yeah, I mean, I think it's a good question. I haven't taught, you know, I've not spent a yeah. lot of time um, talking to communities. I do think that there are people in many communities, and I think it at a, you know, at a citizen level who are concerned with this topic and think that it's important that we have a more fair and just and equitable society. I think um, I would... Uh, point you to the Metropolitan Planning Council's recent study that um, sort of calculates the cost of segregation to our whole mm -hmm. region and to sort of, you know, point out the ways in which all of us pay, are, a, price. pay right. a price for having a segregated metropolitan area. And now being the, the cynic that I'm sometimes accused of being, uh, it seems to me that that, that argument is powerful. <clears throat> if it can be shown that Segregation makes you, as a white woman living in an upper class white neighborhood, suffer. And I can document to you, mm -hmm. here's, this, here's what it's costing you right. to perpetuate this. Then village boards, um, uh, town councils have the motivation to say, look, you know, if we can integrate, maybe we see better economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we see housing values increase because we've got something that, uh, we wouldn't otherwise have. Or, um, my, my sense is that appealing to issues of social justice doesn't get you very far. Yes, right. um, it's usually pocketbook issues that, that make the difference. And so um, it's interesting to hear you talk about these kinds of studies that show, look, there is an actual yes. dollar cost. And this was an, yeah, it was, it's an important, I really think um, it's a great example. I, wasn't, I didn't come with some statistics and, mm. and that <laughs> to tell you about that study, but it is a powerful message that mm -hmm. attempted to do just that, to say put a dollar figure on what's been lost because we have a segregated mm -hmm. region. Um, it, it makes me think of, um, uh, you know, there's a great divide now between urban and rural America. I mean, it's been exacerbated by pe people who have political motives for doing mm -hmm. that kind of, for creating that kind of divisiveness. Um, but uh, I think I read... 60% of the, or maybe two-thirds of the GDP of the country comes out of the top 20 cities in the country. Um, and all those cities, even though housing, there may be still segregation in those cities, they are nonetheless, the cities um, have much more diversity than smaller towns or rural areas. Mm -hmm. And so there seems to be a very strong correlation between diversity and economic growth. Mm -hmm. um, and so that kind of argument um, seems to me uh, could have, could carry weight, even at a local level. You know, mm -hmm. if it's true at the macro, mm -hmm. it's probably true at the micro level mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, are those the kinds of things that you think can move us forward and try to get us out of this baked-in trap that we find ourselves in? Do I think the, I mean, I think those can help, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, one of the sort of themes of social science on race and racial attitudes and race relations, our country is becoming more diverse. Mm -hmm. We need to learn how to... Well, see that as a strength rather that's than a strength. as a weakness. Exactly. Mm -hmm. it is, the diversity is absolutely a strength, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a problem if groups aren't getting along, right? And so I think you see this a little bit in, you, you see it in um, talking to young people who grow up in all white communities and then go off into the world and say, oh, I'm not prepared for this. So I think one of the selling points to some of the communities that you're talking about may mm. well be you're not, you're not well preparing your kids. In fact, if you ask white people, they want diversity for their families. They say they want diversity mm -hmm. for their kids because they want them to learn. Well, they're going to encounter it in the work world. Or exactly, they're exactly. They're going to politics, whatever, whatever other field they're going to find, it's diversity is is the growing trend and so right. if you're not prepared for it right then you're your not your kids be are able at a know. disadvantage right right <laughs> so yeah. i do think there is that that angle that's an important one that um that people say they give lip service to this desire and i think you know part of this is yes and your kids should be part of this not just they should live it <laughs> <laughs> right and you they're know, not living it in a exclusively white suburb somewhere one of the other things that I thought about as I was reading through this is um, uh, 
as you know from economics, the concept of the, the, the rational man or the rational mm -hmm. actor who, mm -hmm. who makes every decision based on weighing all the facts and having, having all the facts and then weighing them cost benefit, which is largely being abandoned now by economists because they realize real human beings don't do that, do that. don't mm -hmm. act that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought about that as uh, in reading through this, that it seems to me that, that your, your concept uh, is very similar, right. um, that people don't weigh all the facts about, oh, gee, there's all these neighborhoods, and here's the school scores, and here's the yes. property values, and here's the trends. That's not how people make these decisions. No, it's not. Yeah. And, and so it's that same kind of debunking of the you know, rational actor Correct. Right. kind of and model. It's, it, and it's interesting, because you're right. Um, many economists have abandoned this. But our, our sort of point in the book is that people who talk about segregation, their models, if you will, their mm -hmm. ideas have not let go of those. They haven't really challenged those assumptions. And so what we are trying to do in the book is to say, look, a housing search process is not a rational process. People don't sit down with their Excel spreadsheets and enter the data and then get an answer <laughs> to where they should live based on how much money they can afford and right. um, their preferences for certain amenities and, um, and sort of calculate this based on complete knowledge. That's the other assumption that is right. rife in this literature, that, that we know all has, possible options. And everyone has just, complete knowledge. Everyone has complete yeah. knowledge, and that's part of couldn't the, be further from the, truth, the point right. here, that it couldn't be right. further from the truth, yeah. So how has your book been received? I mean, do you think that this is going to start to change people's thinking, or at least academics' thinking, about how we approach the issue? I mean, I certainly hope so. <laughs> I mean, I think <laughs> it's gotten... That's why you wrote it. Yes, that's right. why, why we wrote right. it, and, it, and I'm pleased that it is getting mm -hmm. you know good good attention from our colleagues and um, people it seems to resonate it's kind of interesting it 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 does seem to resonate with people on the ground who are working mm -hmm. on these issues mm -hmm. and one of the interesting sort of anecdotes about the book is that it it sort of ha it, it sort of grew out of my experience getting out of the academic world and talking to people working in the real world around mm -hmm. issues of fair housing and housing advocacy and affordable housing and doing talks and talking to people on the ground trying to talk and realizing that my that the theories you know I would sort of mm -hmm. come out and give my talk and there'd be a part of me saying I believe all of this I think it's all true but I think it's a completely incomplete story <laughs> <laughs> and by talking to people there's some of these some of these insights that we have for people on the ground are like yeah, duh. I mean, <laughs> we yeah. know that's not how people search for for housing. Yeah. Right. So I think it's sort of coming. It's a cycle, circle in mm -hmm. research and and the real world, that that for for some people on the ground, they just think, well, what's wrong with you people? Why, yeah. why haven't you? you know that? How could you <laughs> right. not know that? Yeah. And it's just putting it in, in a complete package, mm -hmm. and and letting it and using that as sort of a vehicle to point our way towards, you know, ways to think about and structure programs and policies to try to undo this. Well, I was just going to say that th this, th this is the kind of work that informs policy making. Right. Right. And so that's why it's so important to recognize it at this level as well, right? Right. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And uh, have, you, have you gotten, uh, we only have about 30 seconds left, but have you gotten good reactions from um, policy makers? I mean, I think on the ground, I think it's received well. I think the challenge with the current political climate is that the federal government has backed away from those mm -hmm. um, uh, solutions that were embedded in HUD and the affirmatively mm -hmm. furthering fair housing, that whole thing, right? They've, they've slowed that down, that process. So I think what I'm hearing around the country talking to mm -hmm. people is that people feel it's the, the grassroots and the activists and the local have to start picking up the slack on this topic. And so they're sort of valuing it as a, as a possible um, aid in that process. Great way to sum it up. So Maria, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. It's been a pleasure and as thank always you. I've learned a great deal just by talking to you. So thank, thank you, you once again. Thanks for the opportunity. And thank you for joining us once again on Public Perspective. I'm your host Kevin McDermott. You can see us every Saturday night at 8 on Comcast Channel 19 or find us on the web at publicperspective.tv. So till next time, thank you and good night.